So is she here? That's probably Ben. Right? Oh, it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> See, it gets <laughs> hard for me here. So, so I feel like I'm I'm flying blind. So, I, again, I apologize, but uh, we'll we'll get through this. So, um, with that, it is twelve thirty three. So I may go ahead and call um, the board of health meeting for April 29th, two thousand twenty one, to order. And Anne, I'll have you do roll call. Mayor Kevin Freeman. Present. Commissioner Al French. I don't see him present. Commissioner Josh Kearns. Here. Council President Brian Beggs. Here. Council Member Karen Stratton. Here. Council Member Tim Hattenberg. Here. Mayor Ben Wick. Here. Board Member Andrea Frostad. Andrea, I see you're present, but we cannot hear you. We're going to move on to board member Jason Kenley. Here. And we know that council member Betsy Wilkerson will be late. We do have a quorum. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so next on the agenda is the chair report. Um, and so there's a few things that I wanted to just go over today. First off, um, I want to say congratulations to Amelia Clark. So when Amelia was interviewed for the administrative officer position, she shared that she was going to be working to complete her doctorate in public health. And on behalf of the I'd like to congratulate Dr. Clark for completing her doctorate last week. So congratulations, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you. That is oh, very exciting. So now we all get to call you Dr. Clark. There you go. There you go. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Amelia. You know, it's been a great process of, of going through um, the team here today in admin and and ELT brought me in some some flowers yesterday, and I shared with them in my thank you that when people ask me how I manage to to work and to do what I do, um, a lot of it comes down to having a great team and being able to entrust that they can um, help me get uh, everything done. So um, it's been a, a group effort, but. Um, Man, it feels good to be done. <laughs> feels good. Feels good to be done, and to get past that defense, and um, and just be able to lay it to rest. So, um, I think in doing that, a lot of what I learned through my research on maternal and child health, um, starting to see some of those trends um, here in Washington. So, I'll be able to apply a lot of what I did. So, um, always good to good to learn and good to apply it. So, thank you. Well, congratulations, and and it's also a lot of support from your family because I know it was a lot of time at home, uh, away from your family, as well as you know the pandemic and everything. So I just want to say congratulations, and and we all appreciate the hard work that you've done, and congratulations on getting your doctorate. Um, next, um, it is with kind of sadness for me that a board member Chuck Hafner has uh, turned in his resignation from the Board of Health. Um, Mr. Hafner spent many years in service to the health district, and I so appreciate all his efforts that he's given us. Um, as we know, he resigned um, last year for a bit, and, and his health was, was better, and, and so he came back. Um, but at this point, he's determined that he needs to focus on um, his health and, and that of his wife's. And so um, I have accepted his res resignation. Um, we... I think in filling his position, we need to look at what the new uh, law that has is not signed yet, has not been signed by the governor yet, uh, House Bill 1152, what effect that does have on the health district and the board makeup. And so um, I will want to 
look at that before filling, you know, determining how we fill that position. So uh, just so everyone knows that. And then um, the next thing I wanted to talk about with the frequently and quickly changing updates related to COVID-19 response, the executive committee discussed with the health officer to draft talking points for all of us on uh, breakthrough cases and vaccine promotion strategies, including talking points on the J&J &J issue. And so um, I think you've been seeing that we've been getting those updates. Um, this will allow us to use similar language when we have talking points, um, because we just wanna make sure we're giving a clear and concise message to the public um, with what's happening. You know, as, as Dr. V and Amelia know, it seems like everything's changing on a daily basis. And so, um, so Amelia is working hard to keep us updated so that way we all, again, have the same talking points as we move forward with the community um, for public health and, and what's happening with, with the pandemic as, it, as we move forward. So I just want to make sure that everybody's paying attention to those emails and that we are trying to be very strategic and purposeful in making sure that we have, you know, a, you know kind of one voice and one message that we're getting out to our citizens. As well as that, um, you know, Amelia and, and Dr. Uh, v are going to come out and, and talk to uh, the city councils from our jurisdictions uh, to the county commissioners. So that way, um, if you would like them to come out, you know, and do a presentation to your council, uh, please reach out to them. Because again, we want to make sure that we've got that, you know, people are getting updated if they want to be updated. Um, and getting that, that consistent message out to everyone. So I encourage you all to reach out to Amelia and Dr. Velasquez to, you know, have them come out and talk to your city councils if you would like to do that. Um, and then on June 23rd at 8.45 in the morning, the Health District will be hosting its 30th Annual Awards and Recognition, recognition Reception. This is a great opportunity to recognize the staff for their dedication and the years of service. Following today's meeting, Anne will send out an invitation to all the board members. So I just want you to be aware of that. I think it's still gonna be virtual. Is that right, Amelia? Please pay attention and look forward to that. Um, anything else that you, you can think of, Amelia? Then I will conclude. My, okay, I'll conclude my chair report. And we'll go on to the consent agenda. So if everyone's had a chance to look at the minutes and the vouchers, I would, if there's no questions on that, I would take a motion to approve the consent agenda. This is Brian, so moved. Second. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? Uh, let's, so Tim, I see a raised hand. Is that for? Discussion? Nope. Okay. All those in favor? All those in favor? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the consent agenda, consent agenda is passed unanimously. Um, I don't believe we have any executive session, Michelle. I'll check with you first. No executive session that I'm aware of. Very good. And I don't see any action items on today's agenda. So that, that will let us move into reports. So I'll let Amelia start off with the administrative officer's report. All right, um, Anne, if you would like to go ahead and pull the, the slides up there, um, I'll uh, start off on the report for this month. Um, my, my first, uh, my first item doesn't, uh, there is a slide that goes along with it, but I can uh, start talking. Uh, like to uh, welcome Lola Phillips, our new Deputy Administrative Officer um, here to the Health District and to uh, uh, 
introduce her to all of you. Uh, she joined us April 16th and um, has started uh, just hopping into her orientation, getting to know the health district, uh, working with staff, uh, going to meetings to learn um, as much as possible. And uh, Lola comes to us with many years of state health department experience, along with uh, social service experience uh, here in Spokane with um, a couple of different organizations. So we are thrilled uh, to have her here and on the team and getting to know everyone. And I'm sure that as she continues to get acclimated, there'll be some of the reports um, that uh, she'll be able to do at the board meetings as well. So so um, welcome, Lola. Um, next up, uh, we have the update on the health officer recruitment, just to let you all know where we are in that process. Um, the submission deadline for uh, recruitment proposals on the RFP is next week, May 7th. And then um, we will review the RFPs internally to um, determine uh, which uh, organization we want to go with, which recruitment firm, uh, then we will contract the uh, con do the award contract, and then I will provide an update to all of you on May 27th, where we are in that process, and then to obviously get started after that. And then um, just another quick update, uh, you all had asked about um, uh, me putting together a proposal for the strategic plan. And so at our next meeting, May 27th, I will present draft one of how I kind of see um, strategic planning working here at the health district this year. Um, on the 20th, I'll also uh, show that to the executive committee so that, you know, just in line with kind of how um, we plan our meetings uh, for feedback. And uh, uh, Commissioner Cuny um, already shared, but wanted to remind everyone about the um, awards and recognition ceremony. That is such a great event, and you know, have to having to have it uh, virtually. It we try to make it as special as possible, and such a great uh, way to to honor staff and to celebrate them. And then for this month's COVID-19 update, I've asked uh, Kelly Hawkins to participate in that because a lot of our communications right now and just community conversations are um, around vaccines and around, you know, what's going on in the community to get the word out. So I know I've been sending you lots of updates, but thought it might be helpful to have Kelly um, talk about some of those initiatives as well. So Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to take a moment um, after National Public Health Week to give you um, my sincere thanks for the support that you gave us during that week. It really meant a lot. Thank you for your proclamations and kind words that you've shared because we passed those along to the staff this past week and throughout National Public Health Week. And I think that it really meant a lot to our team to be recognized because I got a lot of messages back from staff saying how much they appreciated it. So thank you very much. And then, yes, I was asked to talk about, I know there's a lot of questions around vaccine hesitancy, especially among young adults. And so um, I am happy to tell you about some of the plans we have in place. We're really in the planning strategy, strategizing phase right now of how to reach out to this group. We have a little bit of a head start because um, if you are experiencing deja vu, we, this was also a group we needed to reach out to when it came to masking. And as you can see, we have some photos from a photo shoot back when we were doing masking because we knew when vaccination time came, we needed a shot of our young people with a Band-Aid on their arms. So we, we did that and we'll be utilizing those coming up. Um, on the next slide, just to start out, when it comes to um, society's big challenges, uh, one of the th places we look to is the Frameworks Institute. And 
um, see, we see vaccine as a preventative measure, but we often struggle to act together before it's too late. So there are reasons for this. We have a built-in tendency to assume that things will continue as they are, even when the norm has been disrupted. We also prefer rewards now over delayed benefits, which the vaccine seems to be, um, even if the prize is bigger later. We default to focusing on the here and now, though we all have the desire to leave a positive legacy for the future. So um, there are three ways to spark a preventative mindset that's connecting what we do now um, and what it leads to later make it society's shared responsibility and explain the potential for future harm without dwelling on it, without being negative, which we get a lot of feedback when it comes to uh, um, the COVID-19 messaging. Um, on the next slide, you take and combine that knowledge with what we do know about our target audience, which is they're not worried about catching or spreading COVID-19. They feel social pressure to vaccinate, but not from those that they care about. It's out of their way or inconvenient. They don't believe the vaccines are effective or they believe vaccines may put their health at risk. And they do believe in science, but whose? That was very similar with um, masking. And um, they care about those who are important to them and how vaccination impacts them personally. And then on the next slide, um, if you combine that knowledge with the message messages and images that are the most appealing and speak to their concerns and interests. Um, the audience needs to recognize themselves um, or those who are important to them. Um, they need to be candid, frank, direct, uh, recognize their concerns. I still have to wear masks anyway. It's hard to schedule or find time for an appointment. COVID-19 isn't a risk for me. The vaccine causes infertility, especially among young women. They're concerned about that misinformation, which is what that is. Um, we need to be empathetic. We need to reference the latest science as much as possible. Draw attention to correct behavior and um, to highlight the positives and and what we can look forward to and then just empower them um, let them know this is a way to take action and on the next slide basically what that all boils down to is that getting vaccinated makes a difference so vaccines protect you loved ones and vulnerable people in our community. Vaccines can help get us back to the things we love like traveling and gathering with friends and family. And vaccines are easy to schedule, they're free, and it's a quick process. So those are our key messages in the campaign. The platforms we're going to be using um, are digital platforms because those are how we're going to reach that 18 to 29 demographic. So your Instagram and Instagram stories and Facebook advertising, YouTube, your OTT, which is over the top and refers to the delivery of film and TV content via the internet, um, Snapchat. And then also on the next slide, we have Spotify as a platform and in-app video via geofencing and geotargeting because that's really getting them where they are, right? So um, making sure we're, we have ads pop up within their apps like uh, direction apps, games, weather, news, fitness, and they're looking at those things in maybe while they're having lunch at a trendy spot or drinks that evening or um, on their campuses. So we'll geofence those, those areas. And what it comes down to, uh, what we're going to look at basically is video. Using video on those platforms is the best way um, to get their attention and most appealing. And we have three concepts. This is just one of them, but we call this my brain while getting the vaccine. So you see a young person getting the vaccine and what is she thinking about? And we have various images of uh, farmer's markets or Silverwood or traveling, going to a hockey game boating on the lake, um, a concert out at Northern Quest. Um, those refer to some of those concepts I talked about earlier. These are the things they can look forward to, the things they value. 
why it is worth getting a vaccine. Other ideas, the two other concepts for videos are appealing to their desire to help the community. So show how the vaccine helps others. And then the third, appealing to their need for it to be free, easy, simple process. And, and they aren't the only audience that we're seeing that we need to get that message out to. There's still questions coming, like how much is it going to cost when we think, gosh, we feel like we've been getting that message out for so long, you know, that this is free. But that question is still coming up. And there's still also this perception from when vaccines were first available that it, it's going to be a struggle to find an appointment and it's going to take a lot of time to get it. And it really, it really doesn't. It's as quick as a click, fill out your information. And then when it's time to go, it's what, 30 minutes max. And then keep in mind, these videos are quick. They're 30 second videos. They provide that's what performs well on the platforms that we're using and they're the most effective for the younger audience. In addition to that, um, we we'll have all of our other tools in our toolbox, right? Our a website, landing page, um, social media, post where we can um, participate in social media trends that appeal to the younger demographic mixed in with posts that directly counter that misinformation. So we're giving them the facts and we're linking them within those posts to science information. So we're having fun with the posts, but then within our message, we're making sure that we're guiding them to a place where they get to see the science and the facts. And um, and be able to touch on all of those um, important elements that I referred to earlier. Um, we'll still work with in-kind um, billboards, mobile billboard, but also um, our partners um, already been working with the schools and making sure that the communicators at schools have talking points to help them encourage vaccinations of uh, 16 and 17 year olds, for example, and we can continue that um, as vaccines become available to the 12 year olds and up, hopefully in the not too far future. Um, in addition, um, we have partners that we're working on actually right now we're working with GSI, the Spokane Arena and um, the Department of Health Max vaccination team at the arena to create a happy hour vaccination events either on Tuesdays or Wednesdays uh, from five to seven. They'll include incentives such as free food, drawings, giveaways, photo ops with uh, Boomer, or the shock box and radio remote uh, we've all thrown in the thrown ideas forward and our first planning meeting is Monday to determine a timeline and and who can do what but I'm pretty excited about that I just today actually learned of um, some more uh, research information that came out that you know people are being encouraged to vaccinate um, with incentives you know that you would think Someone wouldn't make a decision to go and get a vaccine because they're getting a free coffee card, but actually they are. They hear that they'll get a free coffee card and they think, okay, I guess I will go get vaccinated, um, especially amongst this younger group. And then also the shareable moment when I mentioned earlier, they need to see their friends and and see people that uh, they are familiar with getting vaccinated. So if we create an atmosphere that's shareable, um, where there is some music or some free food or something fun going on, um, a photo backdrop that they can, you know, take a picture with, then they'll do that. And then more people will see that and hopefully encourage others to follow suit and get their vaccine. So those are what we're working on right now. Of course, there's lots of efforts ongoing before this campaign. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to ask. Um, one yeah. thing, um, one thing I do want to add into um, our report is that uh, with Lindia's retirement, um, Steve Smith is actually going to start transitioning into the role of incident commander for uh, the COVID-19 response. And many of you um, who are who also participate in that COVID-19 recovery meeting on Tuesdays um, know Steve from his work um, on the data, and so uh, they're going to start that transition in May to make sure there's plenty of time there. So um, with that can open up for questions. Okay, and I see Dr. Dr. Kinley has a question. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I appreciate all the work you guys are putting into the messaging. Uh, a couple things I think we need to be careful with when we speak about the messaging, though. The fertility piece, I've been asked by a lot of patients about this particular concern. The original story broke because of somebody who used to work at Pfizer 10 years ago proposed that there would be a similar link in the encoding that would attack potentially a spike protein that would look similar in the placenta. Um, I think we need to be careful in saying that it's not true. It hasn't been studied. It's highly unlikely based on the data, but it's not improbable or impossible. And I think that as soon as we step on when we're talking about uh, concerns around whether somebody's going to choose to vaccinate or not, when we say, oh, there's absolutely no way, if somebody comes back and demonstrates that it's possible or probable, then people are going to stop listening to anything else that you have to say at that point. So I just think when we give those messages, we need to be very, very careful and not saying that it's not true or it's misinformation. It may be that we don't have the information yet because really at this point, everything's still a clinical trial because it's emergency use authorization. These are not long-term studied anything because it's all brand new as far as the actual components. So I would just encourage us to be careful with that messaging. Um, I know you guys are working hard on it, but that's, that's a big concern because patients will come in and they'll tell me, well, my doctor said this can't possibly happen and they bring in a study that links something and we go, well, yeah, that looks like maybe that could be possible, but it's not definitive yet because it's still too new to, to guarantee one way or the other. So that would just be the only piece I'd encourage you to be careful with. Thank, thank you. I do uh, appreciate that. Um, I did notice there was an interview with Dr. LaSalle and she did say, you know, like she didn't say like, there's no, absolutely no chance. She, she also said, you know, like the chance would be so like, it was minuscule, but she didn't say absolutely no. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Kelly? Seeing none, thank you, Kelly, very much. And I'll turn it back to Amelia. Um, that, that concludes uh, the administrative officer part of the report if there are no questions. So uh, we're good to move on to Dr. Velasquez. Okay, great, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? I think it's a little bit of an echo. And I don't know if um, someone is uh, muted. But good afternoon. Happy to be here. Uh, hard to uh, follow Kelly and uh, her message. Although I did have suggested some uh, skydivers with color smoke, but uh, that was voted down by the group thinking that it would not attract the um, folks that we're trying to attract. So I have a few things that I would like to share with you today, and some we're going to go into a little bit more detail than others, because some uh, items are going to be an update and some items are, are newer, and I want to discuss those in a little bit more detail. You will also notice as we go through the slides that I've included a little bit of material, more material in the slides, so you can use those as a reference point for uh, other communications or for further investigation. So if you could get the uh, next slide, please. So there are um, five items that I would like to cover with you today. We'll talk a little bit about education. Uh, we'll have a discussion, a conversation about the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine with a timeline of the various events. We'll give you an update on the variants, uh, specifically as it pertains to <clears throat> uh, Spok Washington State and Spokane County. Uh, same thing with breakthrough cases and their relationship to the variants. We'll talk a little bit about an uh, outbreak that we have been managing over the last uh, few weeks of um, uh, salmonella typhi or typhoid fever, as most people know it. And then we'll go into questions uh, and additional discussion. Next one, please. So the first update is on education. And as you know, we continue to meet weekly with all of the superintendents, principals, uh, headmasters, et cetera, from all schools, providing them uh, guidance on a variety of issues. Next one, please. And as many of you may have uh, noticed, uh, we did have, particularly between Easter and spring break, uh, an uptick on cases in uh, students, particularly those that are between 13 and 17, which are the older students. And most of those that were observed in the student population were uh, traced back to uh, sports events. 
in which uh, guidance was not necessarily followed, particularly where you had transportation uh, going back and forth to back and forth to tournaments and buses and masks came off when they shouldn't have, and uh, perhaps windows were closed when they shouldn't have been. We continue to see that the vast majority of transmission in school is from community to uh, staff and faculty, and when we trace those back, is typically associated with um, uh, faculty lounges, uh, breaks, and and other um, when people congregate and their masks may not be on. As you can also tell by the graph, uh, most of those um, are under control now. One of the things I would like to say is that we've added a significant amount of testing. Most of the schools now, particularly all the larger schools are in some of the smaller schools have added testing protocols for sports as well as for students, particularly in special education. And that is helping us identify those cases, whether it's staff, faculty, and or students early before there is transmission in a, in a classroom. So we have uh, seen those um, start to um, move downwards as opposed to upwards, but I want to give you that perspective because last time we looked at it, we had not seen the uptick in cases that um, we observe after uh, spring break, Easter, and some other areas, which by the way, is very consistent with the increasing cases we've seen in the community because of that and um, uh, March Madness and a few other things that came together at the same time. Next one, please. So with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that we've all heard about. Um, as you know, there are three vaccines that are currently available, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. And Johnson & Johnson or Janssen subsidiary has the advantage of being a single dose and not having all of the requirements in terms of storage, which makes it useful uh, when we have uh, populations for whom getting two shots and or having uh, ultra cold storage uh, becomes an issue. So it will be very useful for homebound patients, some rural facilities or some rural communities, as well as inpatients and others. But if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> On April the 13th, uh, there was a fairly rare uh, joint release from the CDC and the FDA regarding the um, occurrence of some fairly rare uh, occurrences of what is called uh, cere cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or CVSD syndrome with thrombocytopenia, which is low platelets, associated with um, the vaccine. And what, I want to say that very carefully because they were reported in the adverse reaction system. And the commonality was that all initial six patients had had a Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, within, there were about two weeks post vaccine between seven and 14 days. So because of that association, the CDC and the FDA recommended a pause on distribution until that could be further investigated. And uh, following the typical protocol, a meeting of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, was uh, convened. The state of Washington did the same, followed the CDC and FDA recommendations as did the regional health district. And before we move on to the next slide, I want to say that at that point in time, we had started the three-week period distribution for the state of Washington. We had about a million doses coming in, in aggregate. And out of that million one uh, doses that were coming, only 21,500 doses were J&J, &J, which is 1.9%, which is the reason why we did not see much of an issue in moving forward with all of the clinics that we had were able to realign to Moderna and Pfizer. Next one, please. So the question is, what is CVST? And CVST is a syndrome that has been known for many, 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 many years. It's something that we do have a frequency on an annual basis that is between 10 and 15 cases per million population at a national level. This is in the US. Uh, the uh, mean age of distribution is about 35 years old. It's more common in uh, women than it is in men to 2.2 uh, to one ratio typically presents with what you would expect of a mini stroke or a small stroke, <clears throat> headache, seizures, uh, blurred vision, weakness, and, and some people actually can pass out or go into a coma if it's significant enough. 
The risk factors for CVSD in the general population have, are many and have been has been associated with uh, oral contraceptive, certain, certain hematologic disorders, uh, cloning disorders, pregnancy, cancer infections, diets, diabetes, dehydration, malnutrition, et cetera. There's a very long list of, uh, sin, of entities that it has been associated with. Now, the reason why we uh, focus on this very specifically is because this was brought to the attention of the committee uh, of the CDC as they reviewed adverse reactions. And uh, just from a um, anatomy perspective, there's 11 sinuses in the brain and that's how the uh, blood that has already circulated through the brain gets pulled and goes back to the lungs and the heart. So a blockage there will cause the equivalent of a, a stroke or mini mini stroke. And I always look at the um, vein of uh, Galen or Galeno, um, which is one of my favorite physicians uh, going back to the Roman Empire. He's the one that actually described the theory of uh, diseases caused by imbalance in the humors, uh, blood, phlegm, uh, black and green and yellow bile. But we won't talk about that. It's happened like history of medicine. So then the question is, is this something that we have seen in COVID patients that have not been immunized? Next one, please. So there have been a number of uh, studies that went back and reviewed the literature uh, that we have uh, around COVID patients. And it is estimated that about five to six cases of CVST have been observed per million of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections around the world. Now, the combination of uh, CVSD with thrombocytopenia, which is decreased platelets, is somewhat rare um, in this COVID patients. But if you think about it, that is uh, five to six cases. In the previous slide, we saw that it was up to 15 cases uh, per a million uh, population. So then the question is, next one, please. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, what do we do and what happened with that information? There were two actions that were taken uh, within a few days uh, of each other. The first one is the uh, European Medicine Agency Safety Committee, which is a PRAC, and there's a lot of acronyms. Uh, uh, this is Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee um, met in Europe to look at the cases that have been reported from the U.S. because, as you know, these vaccines are, are global. They're not just in the U.S. And basically, at that point, we had about uh, we had seven, um, seven or eight uh, cases that were related to the Johnson vaccine with about eight million doses being provided. And the corollary was drawn between some cases that have been reported with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not in the U.S. yet, but is widely used around the world, and particularly in Europe. And a number of clotting disorders have been associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, by proxy, the same way that these cases were reported locally. Some cases have been reported in uh, Europe uh, specifically. And the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine, and Janssen is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, they both use a viral vector. So the theory has been that perhaps it's an autoimmune component of it. But the uh, uh, PRAC uh, concluded that this was a very unusual uh, occurrence and that with a warning label, as we typically have seen in many other drugs for a variety of reasons, will be sufficient, particularly when you look at the uh, effectiveness uh, of the vaccine uh, around the world. Next one, please. So <clears throat> a few days later, as we uh, started to look at that in the U.S., we had uh, provided uh, about 8 million doses, uh, a little bit over 8 million doses around the U.S., and the committee had expanded the search for cases to include blood clots in other parts of the body. So when we did that, we found a total of 15 total cases, including the first uh, six or seven original cases, and the report, um, the reports identified that basically uh, all cases seem to occur in women between 18 and 59 with a median of 37 uh, years of age. 
The frequency is about um, 7 per million in that age group and 0.9 per million if you go look at 50 and older. So in addition to the CVST, um, cases were looked at where you had either um, vein thrombosis in the legs, in the pulmonary area causing the something that we've seen before, like a thromboembolic disorder to the lungs that causes respiratory difficulty, as well as abdominal pain because of um, sinus um, uh, clots in the abdominal uh, cavity. So 13 of the cases were 18 to 49, and two were uh, women 50 to 64. So uh, after this uh, assessment and uh, the data from uh, the CDC and the FDA, next one please. Benefit versus risk is typically utilized to make determinations on therapeutics. So similar to the EMA in Europe, uh, the CDC and the FDA uh, looked at the overall efficacy, and, and just to remind everybody, efficacy is uh, based on clinical trials, effectiveness is based on real life. Both the efficacy and the effectiveness of the vaccine are pretty high. And particularly when you look at um, a mor morbidity and high uh, and mortality, when you look at high morbidity, meaning very symptomatic disease, there's a high level of protection, particularly those cases that are in the hospital, which is about 98% is basically 100%, predicted to be about 100% effective in preventing uh, mortality. And at the bottom, you have the definition of what we consider to be uh, more severe disease that uh, will require potentially hospitalization. I put that there as a, as a reference for the audience. Next one, please. And so on the basis of all of the studies and all of these presentations, all of the studies are, are available uh, on the web. And I will recommend that if uh, you have the time, go and check them out because it includes all the presentations by all of the scientists. And they're really, 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 really good and very, very informative with uh, tons of data. But the CDC and the, F, um, and the uh, FDA came together on the 23rd after reviewing all of those um, parameters that we just described and basically determined that we could go back to utilizing the vaccine and a couple of things uh, will happen. Uh, one is there will be a warning on the label to anyone that gets a vaccine who gets a fact sheet that tells them what to be uh, mindful of and providers uh, we all received some information about what to be mindful of if you're going to utilize this uh, particular vaccine or your patients. Next one please. So there is additional information in the Department of Health, the state of Washington, that is really good. So I put the website there in case anybody wants to go and take a look at it. We also have some information, a lot of information on our uh, srhc.org. We have, re we have resumed um, the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the state of Washington, as well as through the health district and our local partners. Uh, I will tell you, though, that from a quantity perspective, Moderna and Pfizer are still overwhelmingly the vast majority of vaccines we get because they have uh, the manufacturing capacity of both has a uh, vast exceeds what J&J uh, &J has been able to do with their Janssen uh, subsidiary. Next one, please. So with that, we're going to talk a little bit about the variants. <clears throat> and if I go to the next slide, please. Just as a quick reminder, uh, the CDC has a classification that includes three types, mainly we're concerned with the variants of concern and the, or also known as VOC. And the reason for that is because the variants of concern are those in which we do have scientific and clinical evidence that they do uh, cause uh, more severe disease and can increase hospitalization and, and mortality in specific uh, groups. And they can also blunt somewhat even the uh, immune response for an individual and may slightly blunt the immune response elicited from vaccines although not necessarily enough to make the vaccine not as useful. So with that, if we could go on to the next one, please. So these are a metric uh, of uh, variants that are circulating in the U.S. and 
in general terms around the world, there's about 13,000 mutations. And depending on which nomenclature classification you use, there's between 1,200 and 4,000 variants. Most of them are just um, scientifically interesting, but they don't really get associated with any higher incidence of disease. But the ones that do, we do track specifically in the states as variants of concern. And you will see on the right-hand side the um, two uh, California variants, 1429, 1427, as variants of concern, the P1, which is a Brazilian one, 1351, which is a South African variant, in some ways um, mimics what the B117 from the UK um, looks like, and the B117, also known as the UK variant, is the most common one in the U in the world right now, and in the in the US. For the most part, and the reason why I say for the most part is because in the Western states we have a little bit of a increase of the California variants as compared to the B117, and we saw that over the last two months. Although the B117 is projected to be the most common one all over the country, uh, sometime between May and June. Next one, please. So, if we look at the uh, variants in the state of Washington, and these numbers are. Um, as of, uh, I think, Wednesday of this week, today, Wednesday, today is Thursday. As of Wednesday of this week, uh, the week's plan, the days kind of tend to plan around here. But you can tell, and if you recall, uh, when I showed you this last time, the B1429 California variant was a, a lot higher than the B117, but if you look at the color graphs, as we go through March into April, the B117 starts to increase in frequency, is catching up, and more than likely will surpass uh, any of the other variants in the state of Washington. Next one, please. This is a graphic representation just to give you a percentage uh, of uh, where these variants are, and the B117 is 38% of cases, 149 is 26. Other, and other, there's a lot of them in that other category that we will um, uh, not necessarily follow as, um, as closely, but we do track them in the event that any of them um, become of interest and or of concern in the near future. And I can tell you there's a B15261 variant in the U.S. that more than likely will be qualified as a variant of interest in the next um, weeks or two. Next one, please. So closer to home, <clears throat> this is what we have uh, th thus far in the month of April. The month hasn't ended, so we still have a little bit of time to go. But you can tell that we have 18 cases of the 1429. We have 11 cases of the 117 and four cases of the um, B1427 and six cases of the P1, which we identified over the last uh, four weeks, uh, three or four weeks. We didn't have any cases of P1 until about three weeks ago. Next one, please. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about breakthrough cases. And I did the variants first because one of the correlations I want to draw is what is the impact of the variants in the breakthrough cases. Next one, please. So by definition, a breakthrough case is a person that tests positive, either a viral test, viral test, PCR, for example, or an antigen test after two weeks of being fully immunized. I want to take a step back and remind everyone that there's no vaccine that is 100%. Breakthrough cases occur with any va every vaccine that we have, whether it's a flu or measles, or uh, it doesn't really matter. And the reason for that is because vaccines, uh, their biggest contribution is prevent severe disease and, and mortality, but they may not be able to prevent um, mild disease and or infection in individuals. So this was released in the last uh, uh, seven uh, days. And when it was released at a national perspective, we had about 75 million people fully immunized. That number now is uh, closer to 90. And from a perspective, just to give you a total, uh, that means that there are about right now close to 90 people that have had two doses of one of the two vaccines or are two, beyond two weeks of Johnson & Johnson, one shot. But we have about 
over 200 million people in the country that have participated in immunization. Uh, and that's a really, really important number. In the state of Washington, we had 217 cases. When we had 4.4 um, million vaccines, we're over 5.5 right now. Next one, please. In Spokane specifically, we've had confirmed from those 217, 23 cases. Right now, we have seven that are probable. And what that basically means is they may fit the clinical criteria, but we don't have the laboratory confirmation. And we're investigating seven cases that were reported, I'm sorry, 10 cases that were reported for which we don't have all the evidence yet. And as a reminder, what we do with these cases, there is um, genomic sequencing that is done from two specimens, the early specimen and the new specimen, to make sure that we know exactly what we have in this particular case. So it's a, it's a fairly elaborate process. On the next slide, please, we have the correlation of breakthrough cases and um, uh, some of the variants. On the far left, we have a case that um, has not been sequenced that we identified that goes back to um, February. And, and the reason for that is many of these cases, the breakthrough cases are being found uh, coincidentally, meaning it's not that the person has come to the hospital because they're very sick, is because they may have gone to the hospital because they're gonna have a procedure and they test positive. And when you look at the history, they were fully immunized. So by definition, it could be a breakthrough case and you have to go back and look and see which um, variant of the virus that they do have. I wanted to emphasize that because many of these cases have been found uh, coincidentally, not because the people are sicker than, than others. Now, if we go back from April, we have uh, one breakthrough case associated with a P1, and the vast majority of the cases are associated with the B1 uh, 596 that we haven't really discussed very much is very common variant in the country is very common in North America Mexico and uh, Canada or the US Mexico and Canada as opposed to the rest of the world and where is one of the ones we're tracking but no um, additional clinical significance has been attributed to it. The P1, we do know that has some significant clinical aspects that are in, of interest, such as reinfection. And lastly, one case of the B1.2, which is the most common variant in the world, goes back to um, the original virus in Wuhan, China. Next one, please. So this is something that we haven't discussed before, but we do have a salmonella typhi outbreak in the community. And by the way, we have a couple of uh, cases of Clostridium and we had to rule out about a week ago an Ebola case. So I, I mentioned that because uh, the work on all of the other pathogens continues, not just COVID. The team is active in all of the other uh, diseases that are reportable and are, um, can be of significance to the community. Next one, please. So, at this point in time, as of this week, um, actually as of yesterday, uh, we do have uh, five cases that have been identified, four that have been com confirmed by laboratory diagnosis. And the reason for the lag of time between finding a clinical case and possible confirmation is that uh, first, not all cases present the same way, and second, the incubation period is anything between one and three weeks before patients become fully symptomatic, and I'll show that in a minute or two. So it does take a while to um, not only confirm the case, but also go back and find the contacts so you can look at who else needs to be tested. And we have tested a lot of people around these cases. There is a cluster that includes four of these and uh, is all related to some uh, family events from a uh, similar population, uh, traceable back to a chronic carrier. And when we talk about symptoms a little bit later, you will hear me say that um, the uh, organism sometimes find home, finds home in the gallbladder and stays there. It doesn't cause disease to the person, but the person becomes an asymptomatic carrier that sheds uh, organism. So all of the patients that we have uh, locally are between 12 and 37. They're all 
females. Uh, the possible transmissions are traced back to February through March. And the case that is not related to the cluster uh, has been traced back to a trip to Mexico and trips to other countries is usually the most common way that we get this disease in the community. Next one, please. So just as a reminder, this is a pathogen that is transmitted by the fecal oral route, which means someone that is infected, perhaps because they don't wash their hands uh, well enough, uh, could pass that through food or water. In this case, we trace it back to some homemade uh, foods. And because the pathogen is uh, resistant to the acid in the stomach, goes directly to the uh, gastrointestinal tract, where it causes disease or causes some disease and then hides in the gallbladder in the case of um, asymptomatic carriers. Next one, please. So as a general rule, the first uh, seven, 10 days of the disease, it resembles a lot of other diseases. You just don't feel that great. Uh, you may have a headache, you may have a uh, sore throat, you may have cough. So many times people think they have the flu, they have a cold, they have allergies, man, they just don't feel good. You may or may not get uh, gastrointestinal systems, uh, symptoms as you progress through up to the third week is where you actually see the clinical syndrome that is a lot closer to the so-called typhoid uh, fever, and um, uh, which is actually, a typhoid is a Greek name that means ethereal smoke co that causes disease. But um, not every patient ends up in the same place. And that's one of the reasons why it's so complicated sometimes to determine this. And the only way is by either blood or stool culture. And we do the stool diagnosis um, through the Department of Health and some of our referral labs. Next one, please. So these are the symptoms of overall of typhoid fever. And as I mentioned, most of the uh, cases, there's only about 400 cases in the US a year. Uh, three quarters of them are related to some travel in places in which these may be more endemic, such as Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Uh, treated effectively with antibiotics, although uh, they're getting to be antibiotic resistant, so the therapy needs to be very uh, specific to, to the patient. And one of the concerns, of course, is that uh, uh, these patients can get into a significant level of uh, fever and uh, diarrhea that could be be um, life-threatening because of um, a dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, etc. That's why we need to uh, treat these patients. Plus, their body fluids are a source of contamination. So, uh, from a precautions perspective, it's uh, very important to rem to know that they are uh, infected. Next one, please. So with that, I'm going to stop here and see if anybody has any questions about any of the areas that I cover or any other areas. And you will get this presentation so you will have all of this information. Yeah, Dr. Kim. Thank you, Dr. Velasquez. Have you seen any of the research coming out of Harvard and Boston talking about uh, pathogenic priming? They're using Dr. James Lyons-Weiler original work. Uh, basically, what they're saying is that they've run some experimental uh, testing looking at different uh, epitopes of the SARS-CoV-2, and those who've been vaccinated uh, and after having already had COVID and having some more serious adverse reactions than those who had not had COVID and then were vaccinated, if that makes sense. Have you seen any of that yet? Uh, I've seen some of that and I'm tracking that because that would be an interesting, um, something interesting to follow. One of the things that we're doing is we're trying to capture information on immunization of uh, hospitalized patients. Uh, for the same reason, trying to do a, a correlation between uh, prior disease, disease, and immunization, and severity of disease, which is not something that has been tracked, but we're starting to uh, follow that. So more to come on that. I think uh, the more we study, and uh, I think you alluded to something very important, uh, this disease uh, hasn't been around long enough for us to know much. I think we know a lot more than we did a year ago, but in terms of knowledge of a particular organism and all of its sequelae, um, is very early for this particular uh, pathogen. 
And uh, I think we're going to find out uh, a lot more over the next uh, couple of years as we as we further study and as we see uh, perhaps all of the uh, clinical signs or symptoms or syndromes that we have not even associated to the virus yet, which is one of the other theories that there's a lot of things that are related to the virus that we're not seeing because it's not the standard presentation. That's a good, that's a good point and a very good question. Um, it's um, a lot more to learn. There's no question about it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Velasquez? Okay. Uh, um, it looks, I I it looks like, oh, go ahead. I just have a quick question. So on the variants that you talk about, the variants that you talk about, what are the treatments? Is it the same treatment for the variant as it is for COVID? That's a very good question. <clears throat> so I'm going to take it a step back um, and start with uh, the statement that whether it's a wild type, which is the original virus, or the variants, they're transmitted exactly the same way. So the public health uh, guidance and protections uh, protects you. The vaccines do work, including for all the variants. And one of the points that was made on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is that it had a high effectiveness of preventing severe disease and mortality in the presence of variants. And the reason for that is because the Johnson & Johnson, since it started clinical trials about two or three months later, than, uh, two months later than um, Pfizer and Moderna, by the time the clinical trials with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine were full steam ahead, the variants were already in the UK and all over the world. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing, which I think is very important, the monoclonal antibody treatment, if needed, for patients that are uh, sicker does work, whether it's caused by a variant or the wild type. So I just wanted to point the three things because I think your question is really good and reminded me that we should always remind people that the public health guidance works, the vaccine works, and the treatment uh, does work. Great question. Thank you. So, Dr. V, I've got one question for you. On, on the 16 to 18-year-olds, um, are there certain vaccines that they can have or can't have that they're approved for, and do, do they need parental um, authorization for those? Because uh, I've had a friend who is trying to get her 16-year-old daughter vaccinated and was having issues with that. That's a very good question. So at this point in time, the only uh, vaccine that including, included 16 to 18 year olds in the clinical trials for the emergency use authorization was the Pfizer vaccine. So we have to make sure that if we're going to immunize a 16, 17 year old, that um, whatever we're going has Pfizer. That's number one. Number two, uh, there's a lot of the discussion as to whether um, an emancipated minor uh, doctrine, apl doctrine applies or whether you need a parental or guardian consent. Thus far, most places are asking for a parent or guardian consent. And the uh, vaccine clinics that I have been at where they have been 16, 17, they've been there with a parent of guardian. The parent of guardian has signed the actual at the station for the vaccine. So the reason why I say there's a lot of questions, uh, last week on Friday, uh, the ha uh, health officers uh, called for the whole state. That was brought up that there seems to be inconsistency in the way that this is being treated, which is causing some confusion. So we've asked the attorney general to actually um, provide us a direction as to what would be the, be the best way legally to handle this. So at this point in time, I think most places are going with, uh, I will require a parent or guardian, uh, which is a established practice versus um, not pursuing that particular approach. So this Friday, uh, tomorrow, on the health officer's call, we may, uh, hopefully we'll hear what the outcome of that conversation was, because it was referred to, it was referred to the Attorney General's office. And as soon as I get that information, uh, we'll pass it along so you will know, because then we'll have to um, modify our practice. Great question. Thank you, any other questions? 
Okay, thank you very much for your report. Appreciate it. It was very informative. Thank you. My pleasure. So next is the financial report. So Millie, I'm not sure who you have to present the financial report. Yeah, I'll um, I'll go ahead and present. Uh, we everything is included in your packet, both the COVID uh, nineteen response budget along with the agency budget um, financial reports. Really, nothing. Um, out of the ordinary for either of those things. Uh, the state continues to work with the health districts to identify uh, the funding that will come in for uh, the COVID-19 response and what it can be used for. So, um, you know, if it'll be focused on vaccine or, or what the the focus of the funding is. So we're continuing to work with uh, Department of Health to make sure that we are aligning all of the expenditures correctly um, here at the health district and that we spend uh, those funds in the appropriate uh, manner. And so unless anyone has questions on the financials, So it looks like next will be the legislative report. And I know that was attached to our meeting agenda or an announcement. So I don't know if anyone has, I'll let you speak to that and if anyone has questions. Yes, the um, updated uh, legislative uh, agenda, the, the bills that we've been tracking throughout the session, uh, the summary was sent out and is there for you um, to review. And yeah, I think that that's really all um, that we have there. Uh, we are going to be posting the um, a policy uh, specialist to join the health district. We're realigning the position a little bit to be more um, policy and government affairs um, so that it can be, you know, part of the communications department um, along with um, government affairs. And we talked with that um, at the policy committee of the board. But um, other than that, Chair, I don't have any additional reports. Great, thank you. Um, one of the items that's not on it, I'm just gonna just see if, because um, I know the policy committee met, you know, finance has met. Um, if anybody has any, um, you know, comments that they would like to make from either of those committees. Seeing <laughs> see that. <Ned. laughs> Sorry, it took me a while to unmute. Oh, there um, you go, okay, Brian. Yeah, I would just say that we, uh, among other things, covered that we're going to try to come up with a kind of a rhythm of proposed topics to present to the full board. Uh, we were going to do that in conjunction with Amelia last year, and then COVID hit, so we, we didn't do it. So we're going to renew that, and then um, just kind of, and we'll bring it back to the board, but we're just going to go over things that we think the board might find helpful and check it out so that we can drive a little bit more of the content of our meetings uh, over the course of a year. So just wanted to let people know we were thinking that. Great, thank you very much. Um, so then with that, then we go to board member check-in. So I don't, I, I would just have anything you'd like to check in on to go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you. I know it's much harder on, on Zoom than when we used to be able to go around the room. So hopefully at some point here, we'll get to be face-to-face -face and go around the room with each other. Um, if there's no other board member check-ins, then um, the next meeting for the health board will be May 27th of 2021. And I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn uh, today's April 29th, 2021 meeting. Aye. 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 Any opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much, and we will see you next month. Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you.